All right. Um, so here's, a, I think, a very nice sort of general plot from uh, Brohit Papu, just get, getting you thinking about unfolded states of proteins or disordered proteins. Um, I'll use the word more or less interchangeable, but if you think about a protein, we think normally about a protein that has a folded native structure and it's synthesized off the ribosome. We can think about it being unfolded, and so it undergoes a folding reaction. Now there, but there does exist um, proteins, I guess, which remain disordered during their lifetime. So they don't actually fold up into a particular structure, but they're disordered. Um, and so those are often referred to as intrinsically disordered proteins or IDP. Um, and so questions I've been interested in over the years is um, how do proteins fold? What's the initial steps of the folding reaction? Is the first thing um, a hydrophobic collapse? Intrinsic disorder, um, there's both the entire chain can be intrinsically disordered, but also you can have regions of a protein having disorder. Um, and so in fact, like BRCA1, I think it's a couple thousand amino acids, and it has folded domains connected by intrinsically disordered regions, IDR. Uh, some transcription factors fold upon bindings, so they're disordered, they bump into DNA, they fold up, and they initiate transcription. Um, interesting things going on um, in the last, I'd say, five to ten years is phase separation. Uh, normally, we think about secondary structure, tertiary structure, quaternary structure, right, hemoglobin, get the four domains together. Um, but there's this sort of, um, I'd say, sort of a fifth stage or a fifth, uh, an extra level of um, structure, which is um, proteins sort of separate, um, undergo phase separation, just as we think of like ice to water on the um, phase transition, you can get proteins um, floating in solution, get them high enough concentration, change the pH, sometimes add RNA, and they'll phase separate. They'll form these um, liquid-like droplet things, um, and a lot of work's being done on that. Um, other things um, I'm interested in is, um, is water a good solvent for the unfolded states of proteins? And I'll get into what I mean by a good or a poor solvent later on. But it's a general idea. If I have this unfolded chain, is it happily sitting in water, or does it want to collapse um, into a globular shape? And this is what Ro um, Rohit um, plot is illustrating: is we can have highly charged. So I'm showing you on the x-axis fraction positive and fraction negative uh, for uh, the residues of the uh, polymer of the protein. And the general sense is, if you're highly charged, you're expanding. If you're low charged, you're collapsed. And the question is, is can you use, uh, or one of the things I'll talk about today is how do you use small angle X-ray scattering to address these questions? All right. Um, so, all right, so when we can ask the question, how expanded is an unfolded state or an intrinsically disordered protein? And hopefully you're now sort of familiar with these different style plots, whether you're looking at a log linear, so I'm showing you the Y-axis is log intensity versus Q. Um, there's also a log-log plot, which I guess is what comes up most of the time on your screen when you're doing a scattering experiment. So you have log-log, and the one I guess you're just, uh, some of you have just seen, is um, a Kraftke plot, where we multiply by Q squared, so we're multiplying by a parabola, which it tends to accentuate the high Q data. So here's Q squared I of Q, and, um, and you can see the relative shapes. We have this sort of bending over of the log-log plot. Kraftke plots tend to have Sometimes a bump here, which is indicative of a globular shape, or in the case here, which I'm showing you for the scattering for an extended structure, it tends to keep going up and up. All right, let me delve into this a little bit more. Um, so imagine I have a random, um, an unfolded protein has a radius of gyration of 100 angstroms, so fairly big. Then I have one which is 40 angstroms, and then I have one which is 10 angstroms. Um, Dubai came up with a formula for a random walk, which is um, you know, IQ is a function of uh, the radius of gyration, Q, and uh, it's just functional form. So I can take this formula, plug in the RG, and I get these different um, plots here. So whether it's 10, 40, or 100, you can see they have a different width, and that width indicates they have a different radius of gyration. So this is on the standard. Um, log lin or log log plot. If I do what's called the dimensionless log log plot, I what I the difference between these two being I've now scaled the x axis by R G. When I scale the x axis, all of these become superimposable. In other words, I have the scattering from um, my random walk, and it's different depending upon the size. 
But if I scale out that size, I do a um, substitution, or I make a substitution, x equals qrg, now you can see it just becomes a simple function of x, and the rg sort of gets assumed into this um, change in axis, and then I get everybody on top of each other. So when you do this rescaling, it only reports on shape. These essentially are the same molecule once you normalize out the overall size. All right, what do they look like on a crafty plot? They indeed look, so I'm going to now multiply by q squared this plot and plot in here q versus q squared i of q, and you can see they're different. But if I do one more step and I rescale this axis as well as the y-axis, I now can get them all being superimposed. So here's four different ways one can see the data, and in this representation, they're different. But if I rescale the size, they show up the same. Crafty plots, as I showed on the previous slide, are useful for highlighting differences in sort of shape. So here was in a random walk, here's a um, folded up protein, they're clearly different. And so crafty plots are very powerful, but dimensionless crafty plots, which is something I often plot my data in, I find very good because they're accentuating the shape information, but they're scaling out the overall size. So now you can see they're superimposable, just like it is here, but the difference between this plot and this plot is this one we've accentuated the high Q, and I'll show you why that's important. And I have sure. one question. Why do you want to scale them to make them to be superimposable? Um, if, they, if when you rescale them, their curve superimposed, then you're saying the only difference is just their overall size. They're fundamentally the same particle. Where if you go back to this case, they're clearly different. And somebody said, is that difference because they're difference in size or difference in shape? Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's because they're different, they're just fundamentally different. One's this sort of random walk, the other's this collapsed truck. So even if I do a reduced cracky, they'll still look different where if they're fundamentally the same type of particle, a random walk in this case, they'll be superimposed. This is the way it gets you to say, ignore the overall shape, or overall size, just do they have the same shape? It's like if I have a sphere. If I look at a scattering of a big sphere and a small sphere, and the only difference will be is where those, if you move scattering from a sphere being a, a spherical vessel function, if you rescale it, you can get the scattering from a sphere, whether it's big or large, or big or small, to have the identical scattering pattern. So in a sense, you want to say, I don't care about size, I care about shape, and that's what the rescaling does. All right, let me show you some real examples. This is an intrinsically disordered protein, an IDP, in high denaturant, and in water. So here I'm showing you in um, four molar guanidine hydrochloride. This is something where if you add it to a protein solution, most proteins um, will unfold. And then I also have it in uh, potassium chloride, so under aqueous condition. And you can see they're scattering on a log log plot, um, looks fairly similar. If I rescale out the overall size, now you can see the inner part of the curve, which gives you more information on longer distances, looks the same. So this, if you've now started to look at these plots, ah, yeah, that sort of um, looks like a Gaussian in the um, inside which is more or less what the Guinea approximation is. It's saying the first order, all scattering um, is a Gaussian. So this, um, and if you rescale by the size, all the Gaussians sort of superimpose on each other. And now here is where I've done is I've done the reduced or dimensionless craft key plots. I've taken this data, have rescaled the x-axis and the y-axis, and now what you can see is I've gotten rid of the size effect, but you can see there's a considerable difference at higher Q higher Q, shorter distance information. So somehow, this unfolded protein, whether it's in water and denaturant, they are different, as indicated here, but it's more, I wouldn't say on the bigger distances, it's not so much different, but it's on the smaller distances. All right. So let me, so here's um, I uh, a plot I've taken um, from Duran's um, very nice uh, sort of review, 20 pages, and she, um, I think it's a sheet, but I'm not sure. Anyway, Dr. Durant um, did a number, uh, put on a crafty plot a number of different proteins. So here we have what I would say is an IDP, rather extended, and its scattering looks like that. So there's a characteristic in this region, everybody more or less tracks, but then it goes up. 
Then I can have um, other ones which have intrinsically disordered regions all the way through globular, and some are mixed. And, um, and this one here is what you typically get for um, a globular particle where it has a hump at some distance. Um, turns out, uh, let me just I think I have another note. Yeah. Um, the scattering pattern of globular proteins in a normalized Kratsky plot, this style, exhibits a bell shaped profile here with a clear maximum value of 1.104 at RGQ equaling the square root of 3, regardless of the size of the protein, and nearly are, um, all are superimposable in the Q range below 3. So below 3 here, these all look the same. So that's what I was trying to say is that. When you do this plot, you sort of get rid of the overall size, and it, everybody superimposes right in this region if they're globular. On the other hand, if they're disordered extended polymers or partially folded with um, intrinsically disordered regions, there'll be some sort of mixture of the two or in between of these two. So anyway, so now if you just somebody shows you a reduced Kratky and you see, ah, there's a hump here, you say, ah, there's probably a globular particle. If you see the scattering going up at higher Q or RGQ, um, that means it's a disordered polymer. So I find this is a very informative plot because I can immediately look at the scattering pattern and get a pretty good idea what's, um, what's the overall size and shape or property of the polymer. All right, I'm showing you um, here four different curves depending upon, um, and these were just, I just made this using a program we run in our lab. Here's an unfolded protein. Um, and it will be, um, I believe, the lower one. Here's what happens when you have one domain remaining folded and the other disordered. Here we have both um, two folded domains connected by a linker, and here's the folded one. So you can sort of get an idea if that's going to be the collapsed one. Here's the extended one, and the other two are in between. Now let me go ahead and put these scattering on um, a crafty plot our dimensionless Kratky plot. Um, so here's the folded protein, two folded domains connected by a linker, folded domain with an extended region, then a fully random one. All right, so this one here, um, only look at the, uh, the red data points. The red data points are the data, the other one is my attempt to fit it. And you'll see where I got the fit um, by the end of the uh, presentation. All right, so what you're looking at here is the red dotted line has that hump which should give you an indication it's a globular protein. This guy looks a little bit different as you do the dimensionless Kratky plot. Um, and this one is, um, sort of looks similar, but it, it is different. And then here we have our random walk, and that clearly looks like what we had back here. So here's a random walk, or oh, I guess I'd say self-avoiding random walk, our collapsed particle, and the others are in between. As I'm saying, is that it's very useful when you do the reduced Kratky plot. You don't have to do any fitting, and you say, ah, globular particle, extended, sort of like a random walk, and then anything else is probably going to be in, there. It's going to be in between. Questions? So, when you like the rescale of all the, uh, the, uh, the dimensionless like Kratky plot, um, will that introduce any like artifact or bias? There, um, because you're assuming there are like a no shape and no globular shape, or yeah, it's a good question. Um, so one of the issues you get um, is that at higher Q, so Q beyond around 0.2 inverse angstrom, hydration becomes an issue. When I'm showing you these cartoons and I'm calculating the scattering pattern, I'm saying I'll just make a polymer. I'll assume it's in vacuum, but we know um, we've gotten into hydration issues here. A little bit. I mean, it's been mentioned, but it hasn't been really yeah. so, All right. So, I mean, the hydration shows up in a variety of different ways. One, even if I have a globular protein, water can't get within the radius of a water molecule. So, in a sense, if you think about it, we have dense protein, a little bit, not almost, I'm going to say quite vacuum, but I mean, there's nothing there. There's nothing there, vacuum, right? And then we have um, water showing up, and the water will have some hydration shells, and sometimes you can actually see the G of R, the pair correlation function, go out with the water layering. Same, so we can, if we're comfortable thinking about that, and say, well, what happens when I have an unfolded protein? Well, and the same sort of effects are going to happen. The water's going to be around it. You have plus charges, minus charges, 
um, hydrophobic polar, so hydration around the protein, the, our, the unfolded polymer, our unfolded protein, is going to be variable. It's not just going to be like vacuum. So there's various algorithms out there by a number of labs. My lab's done one, but I think it's sort of becoming standard in, um, what's your favorite scattering program? Um, uh, Chrysol? I'm in Foxus or Lexus. Or yeah. And they have good water um, corrections. And so water, even if you rescale the overall size and shape, water you can't rescale out. So when somebody says, where does water matter? I can say below around 0.2 inverse angstrom, I can sort of ignore it. So below 0.2 means bigger distances than uh, bigger distance. But if I go to higher Q, we're looking at more subtle features. So it turns out if you, um, if you properly hydrate a molecule and rescap for a small one and a big one, put them on the same Kratky plot, they'll generally agree in this part of the curve, but at the higher Q, they'll start to disagree. So even though the re so in the ideal case when you do the dimensional tracky, you rescaled out the size and shape information, but then there's still the water issue, and that causes a little problem. So I, my general rule of thumb is you can sort of work with all the theoretical models fairly well out to around 0.2 inverse angstrom. So you're saying that you scale at the low Q and, uh, and uh, take the features that are like a higher Q. Yeah, so this area is generally good, but appreciate I've already rescaled out the size effect here. So I look in both, the, I say the normal scattering space, log log, and I look in the renormalized space. And when you're fitting data towards the end, you, you'll see this become apparent. You'll say, how far out do I want to fit it? And ideally, it's going to be robust. I can fit. So you can um, program we use, it'll fit out to here, and you can see if it extrapolates well, and then you're pretty confident things are working. Robert has a question from the remote. Yes. In the examples of mixed systems, fit is often pretty poor. Is there a way to get a good fit accounting for the mixed system? Not that I'm aware of. The way we handle it is by doing simulation. Um, we will... So in something like this um, case here, we can go ahead and model, create an ensemble of structures, and calculate the scattering pattern, see how well it fits. So if it fits well, then you say, well, that's consistent with the model. On the other hand, if it doesn't do well, you can say, well, can I modify my model to get it to fit the data? Other, there's a lot of other algorithms out there where you give it a bunch of all possible structures, and it selects a subset to fit the data. So mm -hmm. there's two different, there's different approaches. One is sort of create different models and see which ones fit. Other cases, people say, here's 20 possible things I can think of be. Can I select five which um, agree with the data? But generally, I'm not aware of anything which really does a good job in mixed systems. All right. Um, Here's the Dubai formula for a random walk um, that I presented earlier, and that is the blue guy right here. Um, the red is, if you remember, is this intrinsically disordered protein in water or in chemical denaturant. And you can see the Dubai model doesn't quite agree. It's fairly well here, but you get some deviation. There's other models out there, swollen Gaussian coil model. Um, which is this gray one here that doesn't do a very good job. A colleague of mine, Carl Freed, came up as a very complicated derivation using renormalization theory for a self-avoiding random walk. So I distinguish between a random walk, right? You just take random steps. But if you have a chain and you do a random walk, it can't cross itself, right? So um, physically, that's not a possible model, um, even though they've calculated a scattering for an ideal random walk, that there's uh, a more physical quantity we call the self-avoiding random walk, S-A-R-W. So you'll see this a number of times. That one does reasonably well out to a QRG of about four and a half or five. Um, here's the Gaussian approximation, right? Assume it's, right, this fundamental thing about a Gaussian approximation, you're basically saying, assume it's um, a Gaussian at the beginning, and that's what it would look like. So out here is where you get information on the finer structure in here where you get information on the radius of gyration. 
All right, so here's the red and the black are data. The rest are models. This one does sort of okay on the um, hygiene agent. Nobody's fitting this guy well, not a Dubai model. Um, so the field, so one of the things, this is sort of where we were um, like three or four years ago, is none of the models were fitting our data. So we had to come up with a way of fitting the data. Um, and the way we did that was we correct, um, calculated the molecular form factor for polymers. All right, so what I'm showing you here um, is the scattering for um, scattering for starting from a sphere. So here's a sphere, here's the scattering from a sphere. And it doesn't matter what size sphere it is because we've scaled out the radius of gyration. That was what I was alluding to earlier. All the scattering from a sphere always looks the same. The only difference is, is where these zeros are going to be, where it goes to zero, goes up, down, up. And so you should actually, this should be one you're sort of familiar, you should become familiar with is I see these um, oscillations and you often get it like with virus particles or spherical shells. Cylinders give you this as well, this sort of, this pattern of um, this ringing, I guess you could call it. Um, but the point here is all spheres will give you the same scattering pattern once you normalize out for size. If I do it on a dimensionless Kraftke plot, the zeros still remain the zeros, but it accentuates um, the scattering up here. All right, so this is a sphere. If I change, if it's in, it becomes an ellipse and I change the axle ratio, you can see it drastically changes the dimensionless Kraftke plot. So we call this a molecular form factor for spheres or ellipse. And what we want to do is create a molecular form factor, an MFF, for disordered polymers. And as you can see from the slide before this, there didn't exist a good model. All right, let me just go a little bit more into uh, scaling laws. Um, so there's a general form for a biological variable for animals is um, something goes as a size to some exponent nu. And if you think about like weight, how does the weight scale? Um, generally, it will scale with um, the dimensions to the cube, right? Spheres, four thirds pi r cubed. Um, the mass is going as r cubed. Therefore, the, radi um, the radius, the size of the animal is going as mass to the one third or new in this sort of form, new to the one third. So I guess we're, we're completely uh, familiar with sort of scaling laws for spheres. Um, there's a famous one. Uh, for Kleibler's law, which a ma uh, metabolic rate scales as mass to the three quarters. So here we're doing mass, here we're doing metabolic rate. I love it, it's over like 21 um, decades here. And you know, as you go from mammals to amphibians and lower organisms, um, they, they shift a little bit. But fundamentally, we have this metabolic rate is proportional of mass to the new, where new in this is, case is three quarters. I plot it as a log, log plot the slope. If I just take the log of this, the slope comes down, goes out in front, so we can get, if we plot it like this, we just measure the slope, we get our new. All right, so this is sort of a, a thinking which we're now going to go apply to um, polymers. All right, so we're all familiar with the radius of gyration. Uh, it turns out if I take um, a protein of various lengths and plot the radius of gyration as a function of the length, um, and being the number of amino acids. Um, it'll, it potentially, and it'll turn out, it does have, give you a plot which looks like this, which has a slope. Um, yeah, all right. So we can all, I mean, it's easy to think about radius of gyration, um, RMSD from the center of mass. The other quantity um, polymer chemists or polymer physicists like to think about is R n to n. In other words, here's my um, n and c termini of my protein, and here it goes around. This would be the end to end distance. Here's the radius of gyration, approximate value. And you can see, sort of obvious, the radius of gyration is going to be smaller than the average end to end distance. Um, this plot works for RG. It also works for um, the end to end distance, or the distance between any two residues as a function of the separation distance. So typically people present it as RG versus length, 
there's this alternative way of doing it, which is the average distance between two residues, I and J, versus I, um, this separation between I and J. So if this is residue 30, this is residue 15, this, this value I put here would be the difference, 30 minus 15 is 15. And I looked uh, at what the average distance is of all the different polymer shapes between these two residues. Um, and I plot that versus this. You get a very similar scaling law. Formally, they're different. Practically speaking, they're within a couple percent of each other. So some people think um, in terms of this. Um, other people think in terms of this. It's not too important which one for most of what I'm talking about today, but just appreciate there are, they are slightly different. Questions on that? We're seeing we're, we're sort of doing two different scaling laws, but they're sort of the same one. It's just couched in different terms. All right. Um, so this new, if you remember, it's a, it's a slope. It's also that exponent. And here's just a simulation of a self-avoiding random walk. Self-avoiding meaning it doesn't cross through itself. And this is where you could think about the interactions of um, the protein chain with water are better than the protein with itself. Essentially, you can say if this is just a hard sphere um, polymer, it just doesn't can't go through each other, but it doesn't want to stick to each other. It'd rather be solvated to get the self-avoiding random walk. It has, it turns out, a new of uh, three fifths. I'm not deriving that. It's a very complicated derivation. And but the value people get is around 0 0.6, 0 0.59, 0 0.61 for this. If I do a random walk, this is the non-physical one. You can see the spheres interpenetrate each other. Nu is a half. Um, this is sort of like when you're doing error analysis, how does your error scale with the number of observations, square root of n? Everybody's good with that. Essentially, how far if I go left or right randomly, if I go out n. How far am I from where I start? It goes to the square root of the number of steps. Square root of the number of steps, square root, means the exponent's one half. So how far the chain um, goes as a function of length goes as n to the one half. So this one, I could hopefully you can think about it through, uh, your statistics and say, oh, yeah, I know that one. This one is not as obvious because you have that extra self-avoiding um, property. Um, then you can have, imagine you're a glob, you're in what's called a pore solvent. The chain much prefers to interact with itself rather than with water, so it's just going to condense down in, and then the scaling becomes like a sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed. Um, and so if you were to be able to get um, different protein lengths under each of these different conditions, they hopefully would trace out these curves. Um, and indeed, um, this is for chemically denatured proteins. These are a bunch of data points, and amazingly, they all fall right on this line. So they're a very good approximation, unfolded proteins, intrinsically to, um, disordered proteins, in chemical denaturants, obey the self-avoiding random walk trend. Questions on this? Um, so Alice Holhouse and Rohit Papu, uh, went out into the PDB and got information. So here's this, this plot here is, in fact, I'm in the same reference I was doing um, from Cone et al. Um, yeah, it gives a slope of 0.59. Here it is for just proteins in the PDB. And I just thought it'd be interesting. It's sort of a nice plot. And you can see here's that new apparent of 0.33, which means it's sort of globular objects. Um, but not all of them, right? You can get filamentous, filamentous proteins are being extended and off the line, but a large number of them on the line. So I just thought it was a nice plot. Um, all right, so we want to come up with a way to analyze, I mean, well, oh, first off, let me back up there. All right, there's a new parameter here. I find pretty informative, right? If, it, if, it, if I can measure new, it tells me whether I'm in a good solvent, unfolded state likes to be interacting with solvent, it's in a poor solvent, or it's behaving like a random walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, question. How do some of the proteins uh, end up below the line for a solid sphere? Like, I guess I would say is that some, the, I'd say the other proteins are not 
as spherical or as spherical. So proteins aren't ideal sphere, right? They're probably sure. some sort of extent. So most of them, I'd say, are sort of globular, but not perfectly spherical. So my guess is those ones which are below the line are the ones which tend to be more spherical than the average one. So if but, but your line's not an average. It's for an ideal sphere, correct? Or no, that's an average. Yeah, I mean, the, the trend is, point, is one third, which is what you'd expect for a globular object. So if you just had a bunch of globular objects, and they got bigger and bigger. That's enough to explain the trend. Now, some right. If you're good with me saying, ah, one of them is really elongated, it's going to be off the line above. Then you say anybody below is good for the same opposite reason. It's going to be low because it's more globular than the average. Okay. Yeah, but now, all right. So now you're starting to think the new is a pretty useful thing, right? If I see 0.33 and the scale, ah, oh, yeah. Probably means they're globular. I start to see 0.6, then you say self avoiding random walk. I see 0.5, or 0.5, it means it's a random walk. But hey, wait, that's not physical. Um, and so the way you can get a 0.5, even though it's a non physical, is one that you get, right? If you're self avoiding, you tend to be bigger. If your chain was a little stickier to itself, it would be a little smaller. So if the self avoiding is exactly balanced by um, the tendency of the chain to stick to itself, then you can get a new of a half, even for physical system. So then they call that the theta solving limit. So there's sort of the self-avoiding random walk limit, there's the collapsed globular limit of a third, and then there's the random walk or the, um, or the theta solvent limit where new is a half. All right, so this is the random walk um, derived assuming uh, no, or assuming just a square root of n. And the question I wanted to say is, how can we come up with a general molecular form factor for realistic polymers? And there is really no way of doing that, so we do what many people do nowadays, we turn to simulation. So what we did was, is we said, all right, we have um, an uh, approaching chain, um, and here's the backbone of the protein chain. So this is what we call a C beta level model, where we have a peptide plane, right? The N, C alpha, um, C, and there's my peptide plane. And then the protein has a bunch of these planes connected together. They have side chains. We're just going to think about the side chains as having a C beta carbon. And the C beta carbon between any two residues could either be a hard sphere, which means it's like nothing, 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 and then a high value, so it's nothing, and then it collides. This would be a hard sphere. That's this black line here. Or it could have a little bit of stickiness, some little bit of attraction, um, looking something like a Van der Waals potential, right? So no interaction, a little bit of stickiness or attraction, and then it has a hard sphere core. So what we did was, is we said, let's assume we did simulations with both um, no interaction, and then with a little bit of attraction, a little bit more. And you can sort of think about this as just sort of a stickiness parameter. And so we, we, we ran these simulations. So here's a hard sphere simulation, a little bit sticky, and on, why isn't this guy going? Anyway, this guy should be back. Anyway, so we did it with a little bit. We took our ensemble, and for every pair of residues, residue I and residue J, differing by 20, we plotted their average just separation distance. That's this y-axis here. So if you remember, I had these two different ways of presenting it. And this is where I'm sort of, I've been showing you this is RG versus length, but it's also more or less the same as the R between any two residues or separation. So I'm just making sure you see that I sort of switched over to the other one, but they're exceedingly similar. So the point is, from these ensembles, I can calculate the mean between every residue separation, and I can plot it, and lo and behold, it looks pretty linear. The only time you ever get a deviation is when um, you're really close, and where the polymer's not quite a bit, um, I say, you get into persistence, persistence length issue. Anyway, but you can see, if I can fit the slopes of each one of these, I get 0.59, which is nice and comfortable, because we thought it should be. 0.52, 0 0.45. But even though this is close to the uh, one half limit, um, the random walk limit, 
we still have steric exclusion in our model, but a little bit of attraction. That's how we can be close. And then even if we have more attraction, we can even be more globular, and our new scales is 0.45. All right, um, and we can do this for a bunch of different um, levels of stickiness. And um, yeah, essentially we can do this, we did this at, um, for like 30 different values. And so we got 30 of these different lines. And from those different, um, from those ensembles we generated, we could calculate the scattering pattern. And if you're self-avoiding random walk, you're bigger. If you're a globule because you're sticky, you're smaller, right? If you look at it on a standard log log, hopefully by now you're getting used to thinking about bigger the objects, the more peak they are, the smaller the standard deviation. So radius of generation goes down as they're um, less sticky. Dimen and this is where the power of the dimensionless practice plot becomes um, really apparent. You can see I've, once I've scaled out the size, I've gotten rid of the size effect, how does the details of the shape differ? And you can see they're quite a bit different. So even though, yes, they're a little bit size-wise, but this something at higher Q is telling us information about this new parameter. And it turns out, if you look at these plots, I can immediately say, ah, this is a new of around 0.6, and this is a new of around 0.5, and this is a new of around 0.45. So even just sort of by inspection, you can start to see um, from a dimensionless practice plot what are the, um, some of the properties of the polymer, whether it's in a good solvent, beta solvent, or a poor solvent. You can just almost do it by examination, but you'd really like to be able to do is to fit it. But anyway, essentially what we've done but using simulation is come up with a molecular form factor for extended polymer. And this is what it looks like, just like we had from spheres going to ellipses. As I go from, um, as I change my new, as I add a little bit more attraction, my form factor, whether I'm looking at it in a log-log space or on a dimensionless crack key plot, you can see the information here translates out here because I multiplied by Q squared, it accentuates this part of the curve, which is where I want to look for information about how are the polymers different. Yeah, to some crude level, a random walk's a random walk. That's why they sort of look similar in this regime. But this is telling me in detail the relative balance between protein-protein interactions and solvent-protein interactions. All right, so how well does it work? So um, let me give you a real-world example. This is um, pertactin. Um, it's bio, it's um, involved, it's an autotransporter, it's a membrane protein. Um, the details of its function aren't too important for the moment. What is important is if I chop off 200 residues on the N terminus, or excuse me, the C terminus, I get my N terminal part, um, protected N terminal domain, PNT. This 334 amino acid protein normally forms a beta helix, right? Beta strands but they're in a helical pattern, hence the name beta helix. This turns out to spontaneously unfold even in water. Um, so I'm drawing it as sort of a cartoon here. Here's um, circular dichroism um, spectra. Uh, circular dichroism measures secondary structure. Um, for tactin, the red dotted line here has a strong minimum around 215, indicative of it being a beta sheet. However, as soon as I chop off the C terminal, then the PNT, this PNT, the N-terminal, excuse me, C-terminal domain cut off, looking at the N-terminal domain, it has a classic uh, spectra indicative of a random walk, a random coil um, spectra. So no secondary structure once I cut off the C-terminus. I can do um, nuclear magnetic resonance measurements, NMR. This is a uh, proton, nitrogen, HSQC. If I do the full length protein, um, so each one of these dots represents um, a particular amide proton and it changes where its position is depending upon its chemical environment. If I have a well folded protein, the dots tend to be all spread out. If I have a molten globular or an unfolded protein, they tend to be what they call collapsed into the random <coughs> coil region. So people have been doing these measurements for I'd say probably 30 years. And there's sort of a, a quick finger finish. You do an NMR measurement. You look to see whether the peaks are well dispersed. The native peaks are, the little gray dot. Uh, that one's folded. But you can see these guys are all sort of collapsed in here, and indicative of it being unfolded. 
All right, so amazingly enough, we've cut up this 540 amino acid protein to pieces. Study one of the pieces which spontaneously unfolds. Let's go look at the scattering pattern of that and compare it to what we had calculated using our molecular form factor. And this is what we got. So we're doing it in high levels of denaturant, things on well unfolded. Um, and it's new it is around 0.61. So where I'm actually showing you fits as it's going through, but I'll, I'll go into more detail how we did that. And high denaturant, low level, even lower water. And then even in um, an osmolite, sarcosine, which is a sugar, which tends to make water even um, our proteins stick to each other even more. So you can think about it as anti-denature. So chemical denature and up here, something which is the opposite. So even making water, um, uh, I'd say more um, hydrophobic or more hydrogen bond promoting in the protein with itself down here. And you can see we get a pretty good fit. And the only thing we're doing is we're just changing the new value as you go through it. All right, now this is back to this issue of hydration. Um, so we've rescaled out on this plot um, the RG by looking as well on both of these. So fitting out to around 0.5 has the information content to distinguish whether you're going up at IQ or going down at IQ. So generally speaking, when we're doing analysis using this sort of uh, protocol and the molecular form factor, we feel you sort of need to go out to an RGQ of around five. If RG is 100, what is RGQ of 5? I guess 0.05, right? Now, how about if it's only 10? It's 0.5. So you, and I'm saying, ah, you start worrying about hydration at 0 0.15, 0 0.2, which is in between those. So if you have big objects, you generally can go fairly far out in RGQ without running into hydration. If you have small objects, small polymers, like 20 mers or something, I am not as confident that our, this sort of protocol is going to work because hydration becomes an issue and it starts influencing the high Q scattering. We found it's worked, empirically it's worked rather well from around 50 to 60 amino acids out, but no to caution. All right, so, um, yeah, so let me just, uh, before you go ahead and actually start doing some, our website and start fitting some items here, um, just we can now go back and see, here is our data in chemical denature. The black line here is our fit using our molecular form factor, does a pretty good job, both on the uh, in chemical denature, in the water, we seem to do a fairly good job. Um, and this is around essentially a two parameter fit um, to the data. And you can see it does better than the other models out there. And from this, we're able to get new values. I mean, another reason why I like new is it allows me to compare my polymer to your polymer, even if my polymer is a different size. So imagine mine's 100 amino acids, yours is 200 amino acids, and you say, what, um, which of our polymers um, are more collapsed? And you say, well, mine gives me 20 angstroms, yours gives me 30. There's no real way to compare them because they're different lengths. On the other hand, new is length independent. It tells you how sticky or how much the protein wants to collapse. And that we can compare from protein to protein irrespective of the length. So new I find a more useful parameter to think about when, I, uh, when I'm thinking about polymers than um, uh, radius of gyration, which is a length dependent thing. Um, we've done this with proteins. We've also done this with PEG, polyethylene glycol. It works just as well there as it does with protein. So I think what we really have is a nice empirical sort of um, molecular form factor for uh, polymers. Um, and uh, we have a website up, and I encourage you to go to it and grab some of the data we have available there. Um, and so here's an example of a fit to the data. Reduced chi-squared is nicely near one. Hopefully now the new version has the number of degrees of freedom. Um, gives you the radius of gyration, I0, and the new parameter. And so here's essentially the three parameters we use to fit. The dotted lines are the extrapolated. Um, and you see we can fit here out to seven, go out farther. Um, there's options to only present some fraction of the number of data points, right? Somehow showing this number of data points always bothers me. So we have options of fitting all the data 
but only presenting a subset of the data or rebinning it um, with the appropriate error bars. Um, again, if everything works out nicely, we hope that the chi-squared, reduced chi-squared is near one. Um, but do appreciate if you only have, uh, say, five data points, chi-squared doesn't, often as not, can be 0.7, 1.3. Don't uh, fall in that it has to be near one. It depends upon the number of um, data points. And if you have questions about that, I'm happy to show you some simulations we did just saying how often should chi-squared be close to one as a function of the number of data points you have. Um, yeah, all right, so um, Josh Ryback is now a postdoc with, um, at Princeton when he was a graduate student with me, um, really pushed this whole uh, molecular form factor uh, forward did the simulations. The simulations were based upon a work by John Jumper, um, who uh, AlphaFold, how many of you guys have heard about AlphaFold? Um, He's at uh, the London, uh, the people who won the CAS protein structure prediction consciousness last time. Yeah, John, another guy were the main uh, movers on that um, after he left my lab. And uh, yeah, the work was sort of done at BioCAT. And yeah, and furthermore, let me just say the whole, um, the whole thing grew out of a great collaboration between Patricia Clark, who's a professor at the University of Notre Dame, and her graduate student, Michaela, and Carl Fried, who's been involved in, in this project since the beginning. And with that, um, I encourage you to go to this website and we have data available and just start um, fit a couple data sets. I think we have some globular proteins in there. Um, you can upload your own favorite protein and um, it's a pretty easy use uh, uh, program to use. I'm not sure at what point it will ever be integrated in with raw. Um, it's sort of like everybody has to do things their own way and we did ours and um, Anyway, happy to take any questions unless you got particularly now or if you get while well, you guys are playing around trying to do some fitting with it. Yes. I think it's a great model, but the thing is, if but uh, introducing the Fari components is actually uh, regarding that the solvent is like, for example, if there are more components in the solvent system, we cannot just regard that as a single single thing and then. If there are interactions between solvent and the polymers, and how are going to solve this issue? What is there going to be the third that you want to enter? All right, so you're bringing up a number of good issues. So, Matt, I mean, a couple things. It could be one region goes a little bit helical, and how do you deal with that, right? So, this model in principle is just um, appropriate for polymers where, where we have a little bit of stickiness. So, yes, that's a confounding factor, though. Turns out if you have short, short stretches of helices, they're sort of random, there's sort of a random walk for short length. So you think about it, you go away, you come back, you go away. Eventually, the um, random walk, uh, helix is, it scales its length, right? If you double the number of residues, it doubles its length. Random walks, it doesn't, it doesn't scale like that. So short helices, I think, work are not enough to perturb the model. If you've got really long um, stretches of secondary structure, helices, beta strands, then it's not going to be applicable. But then this is why this is just one of the things you can look at. You can look at NMR to see if you get any dispersion in the peak. You can look at CD, um, look at chemical shift. There's another way you're going to, yeah, you can't just look at your system in one, with one tool here. So yeah, um, hydration is going to be an issue. You've got a region of hydrophobic residues. Maybe they ball up a little bit. Maybe some region forms negative. All of the above is possible. So this is just, I'd say a first step in being able to get a good handle on how to describe things. You can say this is just an average new, and I wouldn't say over the whole polymer, this is an average new, I'd say that's probably right. Um, if you fit mixed systems, then you're um, probably at high Q sensing more the random walk guy, because that's what's, so you sort of have this plus this going out, and then you're getting that. So if you remember at the very beginning, I was, I showed you scattering from mixed systems. And so we've done simulations for people where they say, uh -huh. imagine I have a folded domain and part of it's unfolded. I have a folded domain, folded domain, and a loop. 
And so I did the simulation, I let the loop bounce around, calculate the scattering pattern, and then I let the two domains come apart and repeat the scattering calculation. So the molecular form factor I presented is never going to replace that. I mean, those systems are just much more complicated than you have to do before. So that was a long answer to potentially a short question, but yeah. Uh, what's the potential energy? Uh, it's good. Or is it just like a learn? Um, I'd like to believe Josh gave me the plot of what he did. It really doesn't match. So if you ask, so we, this algorithm is designed to fold protein. And then that's a whole different lecture. And so we use machine learning methods to, to how to train the force field. It's not just as simple as the C beta. All we did here was we just wanted to create an ensemble. So the hard sphere one is sort of obvious. The other ones, all we needed to do is just have some way to have a variable attraction so that it would produce an altered ensemble, which would be able to, we could plot here. So I, is it, was it this? Is it truly? I don't think it was, a, I don't think we actually used a Leonard Jones. I guess is he actually probably used a series of splines, but it, it's not really going to make any difference here. No, I think it's great, but the sure it is. So actually, <clears throat> I'm a little bit sensitive here, so <laughs> we have a real backbone. We have we tested, in fact, so you know Ramachandran plots are okay. So we tested different Ramachandran maps, and it, it didn't make any difference. People can get the rope, the scaling behavior just by connecting spheres. So it's telling you at the length scale as you're looking at here whether I have five atoms or one at one pseudo atom. It's not really going to make much of a difference. That's only going to show up in pro and down in this region or at super high Q, where uh, those sorts of effects are going to show up. So it turns out that a lot of people have models. Nobody's played the whole game where you just tune things and get the molecular form factor like we did. But the idea that you can just have take an ensemble, whether it's a detailed all atom MD simulation or it's a single C alpha B model. For this sort of level resolution, they're both adequate. Uh, one Thanks. question: Like, what is a like optimal like a protein molecule weight that works better for this method? Um, your your question, I guess, I translate into two things. You can't be like a three a threemer, right? You can't be on the order of persistent length. So as you sort of look down here, we get some deviation. So don't go below ten. But I think the the other answer is. If you're a protein in water, you have to worry about hydration. I don't have a sense of I have PEG and, and DMSO. I don't mentally haven't thought about that. But you, so the two issues: one is you can't be near your persistence line. Two, you can't be go so far out that hydration makes an issue. And I said it's it works better than I think. And as empirically, people have been able to apply it fairly well with 60 amino acids. Somebody has to work at 40. And the way I test that would be is I fit it out to one regime and see how well it extrapolates out to there. We appreciate that we're really doing an overall scale factor to get the I zero right. Then we have the width and then we have the new. So I sort of think you want to call it three or two. I'm not going to argue how many three parameters. But the point is, is that if I fit it only out to here and then the data points extrapolate out, I'm pretty confident that we got it right. Because if the hydration were an issue, there's no reason why it should fit that well that far out. Another following up question is like, so when you take a look at the dimension is like correctly plot, so uh, you're, uh, the kind of like curve, the, the arrow, you're, you're, you're doing that based on the model you created from uh, molecular dynamic uh, uh, simulation. But uh, is that kind of curve also give you a rough idea how the uh, overall shape should be like a model? Yeah. So in a sense, this is, I mean, we calculated the scattering and I think we could have, if I remember whose program we used to calculate the hydrated version of the, we basically took our ensemble. There may be, I know it was a thousand structures, 10,000 structures in there. We calculated the scattering pattern for each one of them, added them up. And only any given one doesn't look like this, only from the ensemble. Um, and then we have all the ensemble. We know what the radius of gyration is. We can compare what our model thinks it is versus our fit. Mm -hmm. um, and we get we're accurate to within around a percent or so. But yeah, so we, I, I look at this and I calculate the RG of this chain and all the rest of them. I get an RG value from this one, this one, 
And yeah, the more expanded it is, the bigger the RG. So. All good. All right, if there's no more questions, that's time seven.